Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Latin America show. My name is Enrique Gelista, and it's a pleasure being tonight with all of you. I can see, like, people, they are already connected, so thank you very much. So, well, tonight we have an amazing show. Uh, we're going to talk about wine. We're going to talk about mate. Do you know what is mate? So, well, you are going to have a, well, a quick lesson with our friend Whitney that well, she's going to explain a little bit about it. But, well, mate, that is very important for Uruguay and for some countries that we did, she will let us know about that. Also, we're going to talk about wine. We're going to talk about wine and we're going to listen a little bit of music uh, from a famous artist in Uruguay. So it's gonna be a very interesting show. And also one of the amazing things that we have is as in the Latin America show, always we have prizes for the audience. So first of all, I would like to ask you to follow us in all our social networks. You can find us on Twitter, on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. If you subscribe to YouTube, don't forget to put the bell that is there uh, in order that you know every time that we're uploading a new video. All the previous shows, you can watch them there. We have a uh, talk about different countries, about traditions, about food, about music, about many things from Latin America. And of course, I would like to ask you to share this video with more people. Here on Facebook, you have to hear the button saying share or compartir. And also please tell them that, well, this show is about Latinos and everything that happened across Latin America. So before we start the show, I would like to introduce my friends, mis amigos, Roger Alarcón. Well, hola, como están? Hello, everyone. Now it's time for the Latin American show. And today is, as Enrique said, it's a very special program because we're going to have the best of Uruguay. So stay tuned. Excellent, my dear Roger. And on the other side, and Normally, I used to say the other side, meaning that, well, the other side here in London. However, I'm going to say on the other side of the Atlantic, we have our friend Whitney Mucherino. How are you, Whitney? Hola, todos. Um, I'm good. A little jet lagged, but in the States, taking advantage of the lockdown and being able to go home. So hello, everyone. Um, I hope that you're just as excited as I am to talk mate and wine. Um, and if you're doing dry January, at least you have something to look forward to to purchase for not so dry February. So stay tuned. Perfect, my dear Whitney. And well, it's like, as I said before, we have prices for the audience. And before I tell you how we're going to get the, uh, well, these prices, I would like to say thank you very much for all the people that they are supporting us and they are helping us and they are like, uh, of course, sharing, giving us their, your feedback and all the sponsors that we have had in this show. And well, tonight is a special show also because we are sharing the, pro well, now they are broadcasting uh, through Tubo, that is a new application that you can download in your mobile phones and you can watch programs on demand. So if you are in the United States and Latin America, you will find a lot of different shows there. Also, I would like to say thank you very much to Vino Latinos because you are going to have the opportunity to win a box of six bottles of wine, courtesy of Vinos Latinos. So, well, it's like you are going to have this amazing opportunity to taste these amazing wines from Uruguay and also, well, and Latin America and also Uruguay. Uruguay, thank you very much because, well, if you don't know anything about mate, you will have the opportunity to know more about it because, well, it's a, it's something that is very traditional in that area, very typical for that area, but some people they don't know exactly what it is or the taste. And well, as I said before, we will have the opportunity. Well, not we, because unfortunately. We don't participate in these kind of quizzes, but you are going to have the opportunity to win this bottle of six wines, courtesy of Vinos Latinos, and also a kit of mate. And Winnie, she's going to explain us, as I said, what is this, but also what is about this kit, what this kit contains, or what are the different things that you can win. So if you want to win all of this, it's very easy, you know. In the Latin America show, as we're in the UK, what do we do normally? Quiz. So we're gonna have a quick quiz in order that you can win this amazing prize. Actually, it's like uh, this box of wines, sounds very delicious. And 
I just want to make some clarification here. When we are promoting wine or um, rum and the different drinks that we have in Latin America, it's because it's part of the culture. It's not because we are inviting you to just to get drunk. It's just that you can taste it and you can enjoy the flavor of Latin America. So please enjoy responsibly because well, it's very important for us, but well, also you will have these kind of expert experts tonight that they are going to explain us a little bit more about it. So I would like to encourage you to let us know any questions that you may have or that you want to know about wines because they are fantastic. And I will let you know in a bit, who are they? But now I think so it's time to go with Winnie Nuchereno and to know a little bit more about what is Mate? What is Mate, Whitney? Okay, so let me just adjust this a little bit. All right, so tonight, first of all, welcome everyone and welcome to Making Spanish Simple. Happy to have um, come back in 2021. And like some of the past shows before we did the holidays, I'll be splitting the segment into two parts. And the first is more cultural and we'll introduce one of the most important drinks in Uruguay, as Enrique said, mate. So mate is not just consumed primarily in Uruguay, but also in um, Argentina, Paraguay, Bolivia, Brazil as well. And it is the official drink of Uruguay. In fact, Uruguayan people are the major consumers of mate per capita in the world. They take it any time of the day and night. So many of you might be thinking, what is mate? Okay, so this drink dates back to the pre-Columbian era where the Guarani, and we talked about this way back when we talked about Paraguay, it's not just um, an indigenous language, but it's an indigenous group based in Paraguay and parts of Argentina, Uruguay, and Bolivia. And the Guarani, they discovered and cultivated this plant, which comes from the holly um, plant. And I'm not even going to try to say it, but it looks like Paraguarinesis plant. I did try and say it, say it. I'm not a scientist. And what they do is they dry the leaves and twigs and drink them in hot water, mainly as a wellness beverage. So once the Spanish colonized Paraguay in the 17th century, they too began drinking it and it became the country's chief export. Other South American countries like Brazil, Argentina, and Chile grew the crop as well. And even after the arrival of coffee and other kinds of tea in South America, yerba mate remained one of the most popular drinks in the area. So what does it taste like? It has a very distinctive taste. And like coffee, it can require adjusting to. It is strong, bitter, and vegetal. I mean, it comes from plants, so that's to be expected. Um, the yerba mate tea is loaded with so many things, B vitamins, minerals, and antioxidants. It contains caffeine as well as theobromine, which is responsible for a more balanced energy boost than you get with coffee. Okay. Now this is a drink that is typically consumed between family and friends. And of course, there's a special way to go about serving and drinking it. So each country has a ritual that refers to the standard way of drinking the beverage. So you might know of a different way and that's perfectly fine. So this practice requires a mate, which is um, also known as the dried gourd, the thing you drink it out of, a bombilla, which is that metal straw you see in the picture. That also, you, it doesn't just serve as a straw for drinking, but also it filters out the tea leaves and a thermos for transporting the hot water. Now, during the drinking process, individuals will sit in a circle and one person called the cebador will fill the mate two thirds of the way with leaves, add a little bit of warm water to release the flavors, and then put the bombilla in the mate at an angle so that the straw doesn't get plugged up with all the leaves. And then finally, they top it off with hot water, but not boiling because you don't want to burn the leaves. And this is important if you get this kit, by the way, which I'll explain in a minute. So then the gourd gets passed around, okay? The container that holds the mate that you're drinking out of. And everyone takes a sip through the bombilla. Now this is pre-COVID. I'm sure with COVID, this, this is a nightmare, like a germ nightmare for people. And um, by the way, if and when you get to do this tradition, um, the, the bombilla, if you keep the same bombilla, it's used to sip, but not stir. It's considered very impolite. And there are tons of different types of mates and bombillas. And in South America, each person usually has his or her own unique one. So let's review below this lovely picture, some of the vocab I mentioned, 
um, in Spanish, so you get to learn. It's el mate or la yerba mate is the drink, mate. And el mate is also known as the gourd in that picture that holds it. And then also in it is la bombilla, which is the metal straw. And then el cebador is the person who prepares the mate. And that C-E makes an a, like a S sound, not a K. C before E's and I's makes S. So el cebador, I'll go down to up. La bombilla or bombilla, if we are talking with an Uruguayan accent, which I'll get to later. El mate or la yerba mate, or yerba mate. And again, we're going to get to the sh again. So that's a brief history and description of mate. And why is this important? Well, not only is it a massive part of Uruguayan culture, but as we talked about, we are offering a prize. So let's get into that for a second. So later on this evening, one of the lucky winners of the quiz will receive a yerba mate mixed starter kit courtesy of Euroshop. Sorry. This kit is from Criss Cross, an Argentine company that is an organic producer of unsmoked yerba mate which allows for a cleaner, fresher tasting of the drink. Now this kit offers the following, two kilograms of yerba mate, organic uns unsmoked um, yerba mate, <laughs> the traditional natural um, gourd, which then you obviously get to use in the future, along with the stainless steel curved bombilla. So stay tuned later for our quiz so you can win this fantastic prize and try this very healthy and popular drink. And that is all I have on mate. Stay tuned later on and I'll do some slang and I'll talk about that sh and the vos as well. Okay. Excellent, Whitney. Yeah, that's very interesting. So while you can be one of the winners of this pack, if you haven't tried it, you will have the opportunity to try it. Uh, and you know, well, people that we are in the UK and worldwide, normally we are trying to try new things and new experiences. This is a good one. And actually, I remember a friend that, well, he was from Argentina that, well, all the time in, in his house, yeah, he was carrying this bombilla. Yeah? Uh, and of course, he was sharing. Now, as you said, that, well, now it's like interesting because, well, it's like <laughs> in this time that is like the COVID time, maybe it could be a little bit difficult, but anyway, it's part of it, so well. Okay, so before we continue with the show, and I will let you know who are our guests, I would like to say thank you very much to all the people that they are participating in our chat. So well, like our friend uh, Abhijit, that he's here, Gary Dancy, who is saying hola a todos, hello everyone uh, from London, Liliana uh, Beck, that she's with us, uh, Omar Castañeda, that well, he's saying very interesting, interesting topic for today's program. Thank you very much. Uh, also, Mar is the winner of uh, Five Nights, I think, so Five Nights, last uh, last program, he won Five Nights in Los Cabos, so that's amazing. Uh, also, hello to Adriana Sanchez, Evelyn Franz, who is saying that, well, six battles, well, Monday to Saturday, well, yes, okay, well, if you want to take it like a daily one, yes, that's correct. Uh, Abhijit is saying, uh, uh, is asking that, well, is it snow in Buffalo, Whitney, like in Madrid? Yeah. Um, no. It, yeah. no, not like in Madrid, just a few snowflakes here and there. Okay, so well, it's like <laughs> also, well, here we have, um, we have Yvonne Velasquez, thank you very much, Yvonne. Uh, uh, Evelyn, she's saying that it's January, January too. Yeah, well, but well, in Latin America, we don't have this kind of a uh, dry January or something like that. So, well, uh, Diego Sada. I'm not participating a, on the dry January. I'm not participating. Uh, so you're I not can... participating? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, well, I think so that, well, not a lot of people that are participating. Don't worry about it, my dear Royal. <laughs> Uh, Diego Sandra, uh, thank you very much. We also drink mate. Okay, so well, Whitney, uh, as I said, that well, I have a friend. Well, thank you, uh, Hernan Barros. Uh, well, uh, Leia, that she's here, Ramona, Charlie. Uh, well, Charlie is going to be one of our, our guests. Brian Mack, uh, Pamela Rollins. Okay, so thank you everyone for being here with us. And remember to, shore, to share this video with more people. And well, like, just one question, Whitney, you said like, it's not only in Uruguay and it's not only in Argentina, it's like also in Chile. Uh, yeah, they, I think, I don't know how big it is in Chile, but it definitely is big in the Guarani countries, which are Paraguay, Uruguay, Argentina, and Bolivia, because that's where, although most of the people are from Paraguay, those bordering countries. And I know Brazil, 
has, I believe, has the leaves and is a big exporter as well. So okay. any of those countries, um, definitely mate is perfectly and culturally acceptable, especially in the southern cone. Okay, excellent. So thank you very much, Whitney. So well, now you know if you have friends uh, from that region, well, you can ask them. Uh, well, who are our guests? So well, we have, as always, in the Latin America show, high caliber of guests. So well, we are going to have Carla Ber Ber Bertenol Bertelotti, sorry, that she is from Vinos Latinos UK. Carla, she's an Uruguayan entrepreneur who speaks passionately about the wines, and you will see that, and wine production in her native country. In 2009, she became the UK first specialist importer, distributor, and online retailer of boutique Uruguayan wines. Later, she added Argentinian and Chilean wines to her portfolio and create Vinos Latinos a company dedicated to supplying the on and off trade in the UK with an outstanding range of South American wines. As well as she's running her business, also she hosts tasting for wine clubs and recently she participated as presenter in the uh, presenter for the Battle of Wines TV show. On the other side also, we will have Charlie Arturaola that well, he's a legendary Uruguayan sommelier, film star and polyglot wine educator. He grew up around his father's bar and left his hometown of Montevideo at the age of 20 to travel around Europe, where he landed his first job as a wine waiter on a cruise liner. Charlie, he's a, well, of course, he, is, he has a lot of charisma and he is a wine expert who approached his life passion with expert knowledge and contagious enthusiasm. Uh, his unique presentations are enjoyed around the world in five different languages. And also, well, she has been, he is the only Latin American uh, to be awarded the prize communicator of the year in 2012 with the prestigious international wine and spirits competition in the UK. Also, he's an actor and very well known uh, for works as uh, The Ways of Wine, El Camino del Vino, The Wine Guys, and several wine documentaries such as Uruguay Entre Viñas, a uh, show that is aired by Discovery Channel Latin America and Food Networks Brazil. And he's the president of Miami-based Rapolo Blue Inc., uh, where he lectures, uh, conducts educational tastings, uh, acts as an expert, appraisal for insurance companies, consult with foreign importers, and mentor new members of the wine community. Of course, if I read the summary of both our guests, I can spend the complete hour. But before we go to that one, uh, well, to both of them, I think so. We have a video, Roger. We have yeah, of, yeah, of course. We have an excellent Uruguayan uh, artist. But after you read all that summary, we only can put the best. So I'm just gonna play an amazing song from Jorge Nasser, and then we will talk a little bit about him.
Well, he is, he is Jorge Nasser, and well, he is from Uruguay. So, well, of course, we're going to put uh, this song, well, not this song, but we're going to put uh, all his details. I already saw that, well, I think so, you won't share it here uh, on the comments. However, we're going to put it in the playlist that we have in, uh, in Spotify for the Latin America show. And well, it's like, as I said, let's go to the wines. Friar, give us that teaser, please. Well, now I get, I now unmute. I'm gonna give you an amazing, just a little bit, just to see everyone to be more interested in the wines. amazing and extraordinary places to visit. So, well, now, as I said, a brief of our guests. Here we have Charlie and Carla. Hi, how are you guys? Hi, good to see you. Well, it's a pleasure having you here. A uh, couple of experts in wines in general. We are not going to say only from Uruguay in mm -hmm. general. A couple of experts, one in the UK. Charlie, you are in Italy or in France now? I'm in northern France. I'm right across of you guys, right here by the uh, cliffs in Normandy. Ah, okay. So, well, it's just like passing just here, the, the channel, no? In Brighton, yeah, right across Brighton. Excellent. So, well, it's welcome, both of you. And, well, it's like, uh, oh, well, it's like, yeah, you are just like making us feel bad. Okay, <laughs> thank you very much, Charlie. And, uh, right. and, <laughs> and also Carla, okay, thank you. Well, I'm drinking just Coca-Cola, so well, that's like, quite nice. Anyway, we're, we're digesting, we're digesting, digesting. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so well, I would like to start just asking you, and maybe I will start with you, Charlie. So it's like, tell us a little bit about the uh, history of wines in your world. Well, I mean, this is a, an interesting uh, question because when you talk about the history of Uruguay, there are so many things that happen like everywhere in Latin America in the times, of course, when the Spaniards came. And, and, and this is something interesting because if America was actually uh, discovered back in 1482, Montevideo, the capital of today of Uruguay was actually discovered in 1624. And when we're talking about 1624, we need to talk about the Spaniards, of course, coming and, and discovering San Felipe and Santiago of Montevideo, how is that called? And of course, uh, and when you're talking about San Felipe and Santiago, you got to always go back to the church. And when you talk about, to the, about the church, uh, something that you know, not only happened in Uruguay, also happened in Peru, happened in Mexico, the, the church, the Franciscans, those are the ones that they brought for the first time the, the vid, I mean, the vines from, from of course, mother land as Spain that was. And when we talk about the history and, and the vineyards, of course, has nothing to do what is today, of course, Uruguay, or either what happened in 120, 130, 140 years ago, because in, in today's history, that uh, so the Uruguayan viticulture can be actually probably break down in four different, uh, I mean, of course, together with Carla, we're going to talk about that, how 
uh, you know, immigration actually happens, of course, between 1850, I mean, the, the, the constitution of Uruguay, it was around 1830. And then we have so many innuendos happening, like everywhere in the world, we have uh, the phylloxera, we have something that destroyed the vineyards of Uruguay around 1890. But what is important to actually to, 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 to speak about it is that immigration that came over between 1860 to 1890 to Uruguay. Of course, there were Spaniards that they came afterwards. We do have some uh, great uh, families that they came around that time that is still making wine. And uh, what happened also, you know, in, in, the, in the recent history, because of, of course, in the last 30 years, and as I always like to say, I left Uruguay uh, when I was very young, uh, talking about uh, a grape that was known as Pascal Arriague. And of course, it was a Basque immigrant that came uh, through Argentina to Uruguay. And that was around 1870. But imagine from 1624 to 1870, of course, we did have so many grapes that they were coming to Latin America through the Spaniards. Now, 18, 1890 to 1930s, of course, we did have some uh, action there of, in the vineyards. Uruguay actually was completely different, I would say, in, in terms of, uh, of, of, of viticulture wine making, maybe trying to emulate what was happening already in Europe. Of course, uh, nothing to envy the French or the Italians, but when I talk about this, it's so important to remember those are the pillars that they actually made Uruguayan viticulture so powerful. I will say the Italian families, the Spanish families, and today, of course, you know, we have a world that we can say uh, Uruguay, it's a rainbow of nationalities behind the wine business, right, Carla? It is indeed, yes. And, so, and and in that way, it's like, well, we were we were just watching some images about Uruguay that, well, Uruguay that, well, we, uh, Roger put the video. And I would like to ask you in that way, it's like um, out there, and, and maybe Carla, I don't know if you can support us with this one. It's like, is there any particular area in Uruguay? And I'm just asking this because I haven't been in Uruguay, unfortunately, but is there any particular area or region that they have like the, different, the, the particular weather and characteristics in order that well they can produce this, um, the, 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 the wines or is all across Uruguay? Well, I would say that Uruguay as a whole, it's located in the perfect place to produce good quality wines. It is in the parallel 34, which is considered in the Southern hemisphere as the one having the ideal conditions to produce good quality wines. Just to give you an idea, this would be the same level where New Zealand is, for instance. So we have the right location in the planet. Then we have the climate, this maritime temperate climate. We have the very, very crucially important influence from the Atlantic Ocean, which helps um, uh, regulate the temperatures. So in Uruguay, although we have four very well distinct seasons, it's very rarely before zero, it never freezes, we don't have snow. Um, even when it gets really hot and toasty in the summer, we have the maritime cooling breeze bringing the temperatures down at night. And this is really important, why? Because this cools down the temperature of the grapes, slows down the grape, the, the ripening process, and allows the grapes to achieve not only good complexity of flavors, but also good levels of acidity, which is really important in wine. So we have that for a start. Then, um, as Charlie said, we Uruguay makes wine thanks to immigration. And in terms of regions, the first settlement in Uruguay was Montevideo, which is where, where is now the capital. So the closest um, areas to plant vines were in Montevideo in the north and in an area which is now known as Canelones. So between these two areas, uh, just naturally happened that the conditions were right and the soils uh, were good and the climate was good. So these two areas became what is, what is now the most important viticultural region in Uruguay, which is the southern region where roughly 80% of the wine comes from. We then have another four areas, one to the east, which is mainly Maldonado and La Valleja and Rocha a little bit, 
uh, where the maritime influence is a lot more pronounced and the freshness even higher. And it's an area which is now quite trendy because of some producers that are making a lot of noise from there. Then we have the Western region also in the South that accounts for another for about 6% of the production. Um, that's Colonia. Then we have the Central region that's really, really small, a handful of producers in Rivera and around there, just 1% of production. And then we have the North, uh, uh, sort of Northwest close to the river where Salt and Baisandu are, which are another two very small regions. So it is a small country. Overall, it has the right conditions to produce good quality wines, but there are regional differences. But as I said before, the main growing region is that of the north of Montevideo, Canelones, um, which is a southern region, and a little bit of San Jose, which is immediately to the um, west of those two areas. So they are like many areas, however, they are two main ones that they are producing 80% of the, of the wines right. uh, right. coming from Uruguay. Okay. Yeah. And, and speaking about wine production, not just in Uruguay, but how, what is the size of the wine production in Uruguay compared to like its neighbors, like Chile or Argentina, um, the other countries in the Southern Cone that are also well known for its wine? So the size of the Uruguayan production is very much related to the size of the country. Uruguay is a tiny country. In fact, it's the second smallest country in South America after Suriname. I like to make the comparison. Uruguay is roughly the same size of England with the population of Wales. So we have three million and a half inhabitants. So tiny population. That's why you don't hear much about Uruguay. Um, so to put things into context and then the numbers, I mean, we have these huge neighbors, we have Brazil, Argentina, and Chile, and Uruguay is the fourth largest producer in South America, but way behind these three giants. So we have Argentina in number one, roughly Argentina makes about 11 million hectoliters of wine a year. Argentina is the sixth largest producer in the world. Then we have Chile producing around 10 million hectoliters of wine a year. Way behind that, we have Brazil, which has over 2 million hectoliters. And little Uruguay, depending on the year, makes between 60 and 70 million liters a year. So not million hectoliters, million liters. So you see the differences are incredible, they're massive. Uh, to give you another idea in terms of the production, we have roughly 170 wineries currently in Uruguay, from which 160 produce less than half a million liters a year. Half a million liters might sound a lot, but actually it is not. An average um, producer in Uruguay will have maybe 30, 40 hectares of wines. A large producer in Uruguay, and there's only a handful of those, will have more than 100 hectares. Put those numbers in Argentina, and 100 to 100 hectares in, in Argentina is, is a small producer. So it's, it's all a matter of comparison. But yeah, overall, Uruguay, it's, it's, a, tiny, it's a tiny player in the world. But per capita, it looks like it's doing very, very well, given the small, the, the smaller size of the country and population. That's very impressive. The consumption per capita? Or just the production given the size of the country as well. That's, that's still pretty impressive. Yes, I mean, Uruguay, Uruguay is, is a, uh, I mean, wine is a strong part of the culture in Uruguay. Yes, for sure. And well, talking about this magnificent and quantities, I want to ask a question to Charlie. What kind of grapes we can find in Uruguay? So we can explain this well, a little bit for thank us. Thank you. Thank you. I actually, I wanted to add something because uh, Carla did it so well that, uh, of course, you know, you can, you can tell that she, she sells wine. She actually runs an import company in London. And, and of course, she got the, the, the lingo all together. Bravo, Carla. Um, but imagine a country like Uruguay being so small. Uh, just go back into history and between, uh, I would say, maybe 1830, 1840, all the way to 1890. The, the, the immigrants used to bring a grape or they used to bring a vine. And the name of the grape was the name of the guy who actually was planting the grape. So. When you think about what's going on today in the wine world where, yes, the country of Uruguay, 80% of the vines are red wine, 
of course, we talk about Cabernet de International Grapes, the ones that everybody knows, Cabernet Sauvignon, uh, Cabernet Franc, Petit Verdot, Merlot, and of course, the flagship, of course, we need to talk about Tanat because Tanat is, and, and this is something interesting that I always like to mention because, you know, my family is Basque and they came around 1860 to Uruguay. And, and uh, the, the Basque name of, of, uh, of uh, Tanat, which very, very good color say about the French zone of Madiran, it was brought to Uruguay by a Basque immigrant around 1870. Now, when you talk about, you know, the, the heavy, heavy plantings of red wine uh, grapes, and, and of course, you know, we're talking about the international grapes before, we do have some, some uh, I would say some um, trending grapes that goes around with the climate change that is happening around the world. We do have some small plantings of Arin Arnoa, Marcelan, um, we, we do have Petit Manseng, which is a very, very interesting white oily grape from the Basque country also. But what is interesting is, is to see that in Uruguay, we do have, I mean, to, I mean, take a look at those inky hands, by the way, that is Paul Hobbs and the Deca family. Paul Hobbs is one of the most famous winemakers of uh, Napa Valley working in Uruguay with the Deca's family. And, and is one of the greatest guys in, in the wine uh, business today in the world. But when we talk about the whites, we talk of course about Chardonnay, Sauvignon Blanc. We talk about Viognier, which is a very well-known grape down in the Rhone region here in France. And, and of course, something that is happening and is doing pretty good in London that everybody should actually taste is the Albarino grape. Now, everybody knows Albarino in Northern Europe. Maybe everybody knows Albarino in the Galician part of Spain. But in Uruguay, in the southern, I would say, Atlantic, in the southern Atlantic Ocean, because of the microclimates happening next to the coast of the Atlantic, we do have a superb Albariño white. Now, we can speak about, you know, many other grapes that are, that are happening. There's an interesting amount of things happening right now because of the climate change. Now, one of the things that I like about the viticulture in Uruguay, and mostly the young people, they're, they're into Portuguese grapes, they're into uh, art, different uh, red grapes that you don't find very often. And of course, uh, there's, there's, there's a lot of going on with some of the Italian grapes like Sangiovese. Yes, we do have Tempranillo, but as I said before, the immigration um, first was Spaniards, and of course, then it was Italian. And if I tell you, how many wonderful wineries were set up between 1890 and 1905 for mostly Italian immigrants. It's amazing to see that some of those establishments still open in, in the surrounded part of, of uh, Montevideo, which by the way, I should mention and, 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 and say what Carlo just, just mentioned before. One and a half million people live in Montevideo, which is of course the capital and we are almost, almost what, 3.2, 3 million and 0.2, uh, you know, population. So that's what everybody's drinking wine, which by the way, uh, Whitney, you're right. We, per capita, we drink a lot of wine down there. I mean, I got 40 years outside, but it's good because I think it's Uruguay is between the seventh or the ninth most uh, drinking, uh, you know, country in the world, for what I know. The last number I had, it was like 72 liters a year. I don't know if it's true. Carla, you might have that number. Um, I think it's a lot less now. Uh, yeah, because of the yeah zero tolerance. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> because maybe they are exporting and now uh, Vinos Latino yeah. is bringing all the Everything. wines here to the UK. Oh. So that's very good. <laughs> By the way, the, just that people they know in the audience, well, Carla. I need to help. Is, I need to help. I need to help. I'm Carla sorry. is the one that she is from Vinos Latinos and also while well, they are like sponsoring us, uh, this box of six. Uh, bottles of wine that well is like something that well they were asking here is like uh, at what time is the quiz the quiz is at the end and you know well we're going to make a couple of questions about what we're talking about and also charlie while you were talking about the different grapes and you were talking about a uh, tanat that well is very important and everything and historically tanat it was like a french a very french grape you know right and uh, and, and actually they they were proud of that one however uruguay took it and 
create a massive, uh, well, create a, a, an extraordinary crepe of that one that nowadays is considered as part of the national crepe. You know? How this happened? Well, no, I, well, the question, the, the question should be how it happened. I, you know, I have a saying uh, all the time, you know, the Argentinians, they have Malbec um, and the Chileans, they got Carmenere and the Uruguayans have the, probably the more, the most acidic one, the most tannin. I mean, of course, we not, we, I don't know if we have time to explain tannin, what tannin means here, but just to make it, the story short, is that little thing that actually burns your, 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 your chest when you're drinking a good red wine. But tannat, tannat is, is probably, uh, I would say, one of the most respected grapes in the wine world. And in Uruguay, in Uruguay, the expression of that grape is, is probably a little bit more um, structured, more textured than the French one. And of course, when we talk about the soils, I mean, I'm going to quote someone who is very famous talking about soils all the time in Uruguay. We do have probably the climate of Bordeaux in France, but the soils, they don't help. We have the soils of Burgundy. So imagine when you have the, the, the Atlantic Ocean, you know, from the, from, the, from the Bordeaux region here, and then you have the Burgundy region who has, I mean, this is very, very geeky maybe talking about, but it, it's, it's just to make, you know, the equation. Now, Tanat changes. Yes, I am one of those fellows that maybe 15, 18 years ago, I was the possibility when I left back in 1879, I was able to taste some of those wines from a winemaker that says, where was the last time you left Uruguay? Oh, 1979. I'm gonna give you a bottle of that tannin. Believe it or not, the wine was still alive. And this is something to always mention to people that not, you can actually age the wine. You can cellar the wine. You can actually go from the north, as Carla well mentioned, we, we have to, I mean, if you see the, the, the inky, I mean, this is the word, of course, of the lingo that we use on the wine business, how inky is tanat? Because it's so powerful in tannin structure. And when you talk about how it changes, I mean, I was able to probably go to uh, Maldonado where you have sandy soils and you have clay. Um, you have probably more mellow finesse more delicate structure of the wine. If you go to the north, it's much more macho like, you know, uh, with, with power, you know. And, and when you talk about, and when you talk about um, the, the, the Colonia one, the one that on, on, the, on the west side of the country, th those wines are, are probably a little bit much more uh, together in terms of, uh, I would say, fruit. And, and, and of course, when I talk about fruit, I'm talking about you know, a tanat that has completely uh, different flavor profile in the different regions of Uruguay. I don't know if I answered very well. I mean, the soils and the geology of where Uruguay is, is very important for a grape like tanat, put it that yeah. way. Yeah, perhaps, perhaps I could add a, a little bit on that, if that's okay, uh, yeah. before moving on. Um, so as uh, Enrique was saying, Tanat, it's a, a variety originally from France, that from Madiran, which is a very small appellation in the, in the Southwest. Um, and it was brought to Uruguay by the, the pioneers of the viticulture in Uruguay. Um, it is interesting because as uh, Charlie was saying, some of the grapes acquire the name of the people that kind of promoted them. And in the case of Tanat, we have Pascual Arriague, who, although he didn't particularly introduce the variety in, in Uruguay because uh, it was introduced over a few years by many people, um, he was the one that promoted it commercially. So he had, his, uh, the, he had the first commercial uh, winery in Salto, and he started that in 1870, and he made his first anad in 1887. And he was a, a businessman, a very, very smart businessman. And he put together a group of other like-minded business people in the region to start making wine in a more commercial scale, not just for Uruguay, but for the actual region. So he put Tanat as a representative for, from Uruguay yeah, in front of buyers from various countries. 
and people liked it and they liked it. And this is why eventually other producers decided to keep investing in this variety. And by the 1930s, 1940s, the nut accounted for about 60% of the total plantings in, in Uruguay. Sorry, uh, uh, many uh, which, things percentage? which percentage of the plantings? Uh, 60 percent. That was by oh. the 90, 1930s, 1940s. Yeah. So things happen after that and things evolved and then plantings decreased because uh, the, perhaps consumer preferences changed over time, both locally and, and abroad. And then in the 1990s, uh, new clones were introduced that had, the, had a different, produced different flavor profiles. And I will say that probably in the last 20 years, the style of tanat has changed in Uruguay. And these are made in a more approachable style. Um, and, but there is something else that I wanted to say about Uruguay, just to, about tanat, sorry, just to round out, which is a, a curiosity that might be interesting for the people watching this program, is that tanat is one of the healthiest varieties available that exist. And this is not me saying it, but there's a, a cardiologist called Dr. Roger Corder. He wrote a book called The Wine Diet. It sounds a fun book, but actually it's quite heavy reading, quite scientific. And basically what happened was he was many years ago, he was living in France and he realized that the people from Madiran, from this very small region in France where Tanat is originally from, had a life expectancy of 92. They were the oldest in Europe. And he wondered why they were eating the same amount of saturated fat as the rest of the French, but the only difference is that they were drinking tanat. That prompted him to study the variety, and this is how he discovered that it has three, four times the content of one type of polyphenol, and I don't want to get any technical with this, but this polyphenol basically acts as a cardiovascular protector, so it avoids heart diseases, and he wrote a whole book about it. So tanat has three, four times the contents of this polyphenol, more than a Cabernet Sauvignon, which will be the next one in the line. So Tanat is not only a very versatile and delicious grape, but it's actually good for you. There you go. Wow, <laughs> that sounds amazing. And well, after this, this all this uh, history uh, data, I want to ask Charlie a double question. Which characteristics you find on the Uruguayan wines and how, uh, and how can you pair those wines? Oh, well, you, you know, th this, is, this is interesting too. Of course, you got to understand, I mean, us, the wine tasters of the world, we, we want to make an equation all the time for what type of geology, what type of climate, and what type of grape our plant is where they're coming from. You know, Carla very well actually put together the different parts of, of the country where, you know, today, Uruguay, I, I think we're, we're, planting, we're planting grapes. We're in almost 16 different departments out of the 19 that we have, of course. But once we talk, once we talk about, you know, the elegance and the, 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 the delicate uh, tanning structure of the wine, and I have to say tanning structure because tanat, by the way, tanat means, I mean, uh, the, the word says it all, right? Tanat, tanning, tanning, what is the tanning? Where the tanning come from? It come from the grape, from the skin of the grape, and of course, that is that, that beautiful, I would say, a skeleton backbone that we find in any of those wines. I mean, there, there is an amazing amount of quality going on in, 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 in Uruguay and viticulture and winemaking today that I have to say, if I have to name all of them, I think out of the 18 families, no, actually 36, right, Carla? That we have exporting today, how many we have? About yeah, about forty, yeah, forty. Right. Years. So yeah. we we do have the possibility here to 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 tell the world today that you know Uruguay is ready to pop. Ready, Uruguay is ready to give the the fine wine tasting of the world. You just saw Paul Hoff there, and there are some others. We have Australians, we have New Zealanders, we have Italians, we have Spanish people coming. To, to, to actually to make the harvest all the time. And when we talk about food and wine pairing, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Of course, you know, you have a bottle of tanat, you want, you want to have a good asado. Okay, that's Uruguay and Trevinia. But, you know, many, many of the people today, when I actually talk about which is your favorite wine pairing, I will do a, 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 a nice rare uh, tuna fish 
you know, a, a Sicilian way with eggplant and tomato and spices. And I will have a hearty red blend of Tanat with Cabernet Franc and Cabernet Sauvignon. Now, that is the, that is the fish. That is the fish, uh, I would say, um, pairing. But we do have a good Syrah as well that is making waves in the, in the Maldonado side, in the stony area and sandy soils of the east part of the Atlantic Ocean, where myself, by the way, if I have to do something uh, uh, different with my food, because I, I, I love to cook, I will do a blackened lamb chops, right? Blackened, black, uh, you know, lamb chops. I, I can see Roger actually, you know, salivating them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Actually, one question, Charlie, are you, are you a good cook? Yes, I cook all the time here. My wife too. My, my Welsh wife is also a good cook. I work in the restaurant business for many, many years. I love to cook. I love well, to cook. Maybe, maybe we have to make a, actually a show of that one too. Yeah, so mixing or just pairing, uh, of course, the wines with some food, that, that could be amazing. And, and just, uh, just making a commentary that I'm seeing here on, on, on Facebook that while they are saying that, well, after all the data that you provide us, that both of you provide us about all these kind of benefits about drinking wine, there's one from Lily Martinez that she's saying, well, we don't need much scientist studies to make us to drink wine. So, well, of course, <laughs> it's like, I think it's because we just enjoy it, but well, it's very good to know it. I, 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 by, the way, by the way, Enrique, I have one pair for Whitney here. You know, get a praline, one of those Belgian praline, those they pop in your mouth, you know, a little cherry chocolate and cherry, and get a glass of tanat and come back and tell me, please, because you will you will pop that in your mouth and I will say <laughs> what I'm doing, by the way, tanat and, and, and white chocolate. Also, uh, my oh. goodness, you can have fun if you write chocolate. Remember, Charlie, you, have... you need to give me you need to give me a vegan option for me for the vegan in the room. Oh well, <laughs> well, and, and that is interesting, <laughs> Carla, because you know what? Talking about vegan people, well, we have here Carla Prada. That well, she's saying that well, we're talking about this food and talking about all of this, and she's just eating some salad for dinner. <laughs> so well, it's a little bit. <laughs> A sad story, but well, it's like, yeah, well, anyway, I hope that you enjoyed your salad, Carolina. Yeah. So to help people not salivate and worry about their salad, mm -hmm. we can move on maybe to, <laughs> to Carla. I have a question for you. Um, which are the main countries that um, Uruguay uh, export exports wines to? Sorry. <laughs> what are some um, of those countries? So as I said before, the, the size of the Uruguayan production is quite small and 90% of that roughly is drunk locally. So there isn't a lot left for exports. However, there is plenty. Um, there are about 40 wineries currently exporting to 50 different markets. Half of the exports stay in South America, the majority going to Brazil. About 25% goes to the North, to North America, and uh, mainly to the US. In Europe, we get about 16% of all the exports. The UK currently accounts for about four or 5% of the total exports. And then there is a diversity of countries uh, where they receive small drops of Uruguayan wine. I mean, Uruguayan wine, because it is small production, because of the, these characteristics that I was explaining before, is not the kind of wine that's going to be flooding supermarkets. Although in the UK, you can find, there is at least one in the co-op that you could um, look for, look out for if you want to. But the, the, the best outlets to look for Uruguayan wines will be independent wine merchants. So if you go to your local wine merchant and ask for Uruguayan wines, you are likely to, to find some and otherwise in restaurants. But of course, now with the lockdown, restaurants are out on there. Yeah. For now, yes. It's funny because like right before the show, I'm like, oh, I'm going to buy some Uruguayan wine for here. I I'm in the States right now and okay. it's hard to find. So I'm now like, I'm excited to um, look for, well, I'm looking forward to trying some of uh, the wine through your shop um, very soon because it is hard to find here. And now I think we're all thirsty for it. Where, where, so, where are you with me? Buffalo, New York, my hometown, just for a few weeks. Oh, in Buffalo. Yeah, well, I listen. Know. Want to send me a bottle there? <laughs> well, no, no, I can. Well, my brother lives uh, across the border, but uh, 
But okay. you know, I can tell you in Buffalo where you can go. I mean, let me just ask a couple of guys from Boston, or maybe from Maine, that you can go and I can tell you what to find there. There's many Uruguayans actually that they sell up in New York and, and New Jersey area where there's a lot of people from Uruguay in that area. So. And that's my point. This, that's, this is why we have to have the show so more people know about it and hopefully it can be exported to more countries. So. Mm -hmm. Well, well, that's, that's the truth. But I mean, I, I like what Carla said in today's world, you know, the, 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 the wine has no, no borders, no frontiers. So the wine can go, everybody's making good wine, you know, and Uruguay is, it is uh, an exceptional, uh, I don't know, I'm very challenged, but it's an exceptional country where a lot of good quality is happening these days. Yeah. Well, I've got a question for Charlie. Is it true that Uruguay is the next frontier for the wine scenery? Well, it is. It is because, you know, uh, first of all, the wine scene in Uruguay is a small. I mean, it's not overwhelmed. You know, when I talk about that, I got to talk about it's a it's a country with with niche brands, right? So it's a country that has, I would say, uh, no many families that they export, comparing, of course, with the, the neighbors, no Argentina, Uruguay. You know, I mean, this is this is interesting. I saw the other day two or three families that they actually they're they're coming to Uruguay and they're buying wineries and they're planting vineyards, you know, from Argentina, from Mendoza. I I, uh, I have a couple of doctors from from Vieques from from Puerto Rico that they just went to Atlantida in Canelones to to buy a vineyard that 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 some people left like a hundred acres and this is this is something that of course it's an eye opener because I mean as I I always like to mention to people that you know the whole wine war I live in America for almost thirty five years. We saw when people used to drink Chardonnay and then they start drinking sweet wine, they, they start drinking Merlot, and then they start drinking Pinot, they, they start drinking Syrah. Uh, at some point, of course, people for more than 10, 12 years, they were drinking Malbec, but it's how the, the wine buyers and the, 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 the big trenders, of course, the wine are putting the different grapes. Because of the structure, because of, of the texture of the nut, because of uh, the different uh, and the diversity that Uruguay actually can, of course, bring you a bottle of the nut in a blend with Cabernet or Merlot or Syrah, or maybe as a tanat itself, 100% in a bottle. I think the challenges are there, but the new frontier is because of the palate profile. I mean, the taste. And people are looking today for more structured wines. I mean, I would say Tanat, but there's some others that I, as I mentioned before, Syrah is one of them. Viognier is another one of them. Alvarino is another one of them. I have a very, very famous guy in Belgium telling me, Charlie, when are we going to do the Alvarino from the southern part of the Atlantic and the northern part of the Atlantic? And I say, what a great idea, because, you know, Uruguay is you know, is ready to pop, as I said at the beginning of this, is ready to be one of the Cinderella's of the wine of, of the wine industry. And of course, it's very small, and that is the key. In today's world, people are looking for niche brands for a small family owned. And as Carla can tell you, we don't have big industries of winemaking. That right, Carla? That is correct. Yeah. Um, everything is very artisan, everything is quite small other than you know, there are two large producers or three, but everything is quite small. Yeah. Right. And, and well, a comment, a comment about what you say, which is obviously, well, no, I know the restaurants now are closed and everything, but it's good for the audience to know about all this stuff because wow. uh, I noticed when they go to restaurants, they start to ask uh, for Albariños, for Malbecs. They start to get in more into little... Uh, little all these uh, categories and then start to ask for where it is come from so it's mm -hmm. a good way to inform our audience to about all these categories i mean roger if i may i might tell you what the wine actually the wine experts the wine professionals do myself as a taster you know today working as a, as a wine judge around the world besides my my job as a wine communicator tv host or whatever they they call me so many names lately but what i'm saying 
you know. Uh, one of the things that I, I like, I like the idea um, of uh, um, talk, talk about and teach because this is important. Uh, just follow a grape that you like. I mean, I always uh, mention to people, you like New Zealand or you like Chile or you like America or you like uh, 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 Mexican wine because I, I, I like Mexican wine from Baja California and Ensenada. And I say, well, take the same grape from different continents and take five bottles. Just follow the grape, don't follow the country. And that is something that we love to do with either Merlot, uh, you can do Tanat, uh, of course, you know, Carmener and Malbec or Uruguay, Argentina, and see which one it goes with. Myself, as I always uh, mention to people, I think that Chileans, they have what they deserve a good Carmener, I find that over here very, very often. And the Argentinians, they have the Malbec, which is a party pleaser, right? But the Uruguayans have the Tanat, which is uh, like Carla just said, is, is the wine with more polyphenols. It got uh, Revestrarol, which is also very important for your health and your heartbeat and whatever help you with. And, and, and I like to always mention, try to, Try to te I mean, teach your palate at the nut from Uruguay, at the nut from France, or any grape you choose, Cabernet Sauvignon, which is the most versatile grape we have in the wine world, which by the way, one of my favorite. But imagine a blend of Cabernet and Tanat. Oh my, it's like explosion of, of power. Like we say in France, la puissance. <laughs> Et voilà. <laughs> Well, amazing. We, we're talking about all these topics, all these grapes, all these types and following those a little bit topics about how the people can find the best wine. And tell us, uh, Charlie and Carla, where we can find yourselves, where we can find these wines, your social media networks. Um, so with myself, you can follow um, Carla Vinos on Instagram. That's my my official account, and that's the actually in, so, in terms of social media, that's the the only one that I'm I'm using currently. Well, uh, they can find me in Charlie Wines in Instagram. They can find me in Twitter with Charlie Wines. I have a website actually under repair, but still you can send me an email there. And if you really are watching Latin American, by the way, if you never watch a great wine movie, I highly recommend you not because. My wife and I were the actors of that movie, but The Ways of Wine is in Simple Media in London, in England, and it was uh, it was actually a, a, a great movie about the life of a fellow that lost his wine, his palate, and actually have to recover it. Now, if you have DirecTV, this week you can actually watch my two movies, The Duel of Wine and The Ways of Wine, and you can actually find that. There's a very, very funny comedy. I speak Italian there a lot, and uh, it's a great movie. So, uh, Charlie Wines, you know, that's what I do. So just, just one thing, and, and, and it's more regarding that, well, it's like, I'm just going to make a pause here and just to ask to the audience, because, well, it's like, please, we are not sending any, asking to send any text message or anything. So, well, if you see in the comment section that there are scams coming and asking you to send a message in the Latin America show, we are doing online and all actually all the information that we are sending is coming from the Latin America show when we are asking you something directly. So please avoid all these people that they are just looking and they are scams and they are just looking to, uh, wow. I don't know, to get your information. So. That's a problem where we have a good show, but well, it doesn't matter. So, well, let's, I, I just want to ask, uh, okay, well, we have the networks that, well, we, where we can find you. And of course, well, uh, being of Latinos, I think so, is a, an extraordinary option that, well, or we are already posting here in the comment sections in order that people, they can uh, look for it. But I would like to ask a, a, another question, and, and, and this is more for you, Carla, that, well, it's like, we have been talking about all the history, all the changes, what are the, the challenges that they are like coming? And also about innovation, uh, there is something about an orange wine <laughs> and that well, actually, I haven't seen that before. Okay. That is interesting. I don't know if you can tell us just a bit about that, just to close this section. Absolutely. So um, 
the current Uruguayan wine and scene is really exciting. There is loads going on. There is a lot of foreign investment, as Charlie was mentioning before, people from all over the place, Argentina, Brazil, Japan, the US, and which is really encouraging to see that these people are wanting to invest in the Uruguayan wine industry. Then we have the younger generation of winemakers taking over the family wineries and bringing all the fresh ideas, which is always very welcome and bringing innovation too. And uh, some people and, and lots of small projects keep popping up all the time. So it's a really, really exciting and time to, to watch the Uruguayan wine scene. In regards to innovation, um, yes, there is a lot of new things, but there's lots of uh, going back to the past. And going back to your orange wine question, which actually I have an orange wine here ready for you. Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, I saw that yes. one in the picture. <laughs> yes, I remember that one. Yes. yes. So this is a special wine for me um, that I'm, I feel uh, sentimentally very close to, not only because I imported, but because I was uh, lucky enough to, yeah, that's the one, I was lucky enough to um, help to bring this uh, commercially to, to life. And um, this wine is made by Santiago Deicas, uh, fourth generation of uh, one of the main wine families from Uruguay. And this is his personal project, Bizarra. He makes craft beer and uh, along the lines of making this minimal intervention kind of wines he launched, um, uh, amongst other things, this orange wine. So orange wine is not made of oranges. It's made of grapes. Uh, white grapes, the same white grapes that you will use to make any regular white wine. But instead of crushing the grapes and removing the skin straight away, you leave those skins in contact with the mass was during, during the fermentation and after for a period of time, which could be weeks, it could be months, in some extreme cases could be years. This is the way that humans used to make wine 6,000 years ago in Georgia, when they first started to make wine. Um, this is how it was made. It was made, it was put in clay amphora in underground to keep the, the temperature, everything was crushed. Uh, left there to ferment, to age, and that's how one was. Now, what Santiago is doing is combining this very old ancient technique with the knowledge that we have in the 21st century. Uh, so what happens when you leave all these skins in contact with the, the, the must for this period of time? Well, you get the color. So you'll see I poured some wine here, so you can see. So the color is clearly orange, right? And this is coming from simply the contact of the skin left in contact with, like, like you will make a red wine, right? When you make a red wine, you left the skins in contact with the, with the must and the alcohol extracts the color from the skins. So the same happens with this. So you get the color, but you get the phenolic compounds, you get some tannins as well. So the result is something incredible. It's something that clearly does not fit in any other category. And this is why we have this new-ish, which isn't new at all, but uh, now is having a revival, this new category called orange wine. I really will encourage everyone watching this to try, if they can, this one, the Visada, to show the label again, because it's so cool. <laughs> but if you cannot find this one, try another one. It's one of the most versatile style of wines in terms of food matching that you can uh, come across because it has the texture and the structure and the tannings was having the freshness and the fruitiness and spices from the, the, the white grape. Um, it goes well with spicy food, with really kind of spice, like Moroccan kind of food. It goes well with foods that are high acidity. It's incredibly versatile and it's something really, really interesting. So cheers to you guys. Oh, that's me. <laughs> that's me. <laughs> no, but, but one question, can we find this orange Sorry. wine in... La in oh, oh, well, that's... Yeah. At least, yes. Okay, well, I feel better now. Uh, <laughs> so can we find this wine in Vinos Latino? Of course you can. It is available in the UK in many outlets. And um, yeah, if you contact me or I can, I can send you a direction of all the various places. It's, it's sold all over the country. We have done really well with this orange wine. And just one question, Carla. Well, you are going to give to the audience a box of six that actually I'm just a little bit 
angry about it, but yeah. And not because, well, we are, I think so we're five here. Why are you giving six to the audience? You can give one to all of us and that's it. Yeah, maybe we can say two to one of us and that's it, it doesn't matter. But well, it's like, what kind of wines? Is it a special selection that you have done in order that people, they can try different, um, different um, grapes? Or uh, yes, of course. I would like to send some Tanat, of course, because it's a signature grape from Uruguay, some white wines, because the diversity of Uruguayan wines is quite remarkable. Um, I will include an orange wine as well in there. So, yeah, it will be an interesting selection that will represent what Uruguay can offer uh, nowadays. Yeah. Okay, so I think so. I'm going to cancel the quiz. And I'm just going to send you <laughs> my address. <laughs> and that's it. So thank you very much. There is no yeah, quiz yeah. for anyone tonight. Now, it's like, uh, actually, it's like, uh, thank you very much for both of you. I think so we can talk hours because it's very interesting. And also, we just have like the highlights of the wines because I think so that well. And, and actually, I would like to invite you that maybe in another show we can talk about particular wines and maybe with what kind of pairing we can use. And also, if we can, I don't know, well, you can, you can tell us about all this topic because, well, as I said at the beginning, and actually, I think so the audience will, will agree with me that, well, you are passionate about your topic and you are, of course, you are an expert in this subject. So thank you very much for both of you for being here in the Latin America show. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Uh, as I said, it's not the first time, please. I would like, it's not the only time, not the first time, mind you, why I'm saying that. I remember another show that they were saying that and I was just laughing. No, it's the first time, but well, I hope so. it's not the last time that you will be here with us because, well, the side thinks so that, well, we say, hearing your expertise is amazing. Enrique, we say, el vino nos une, el agua nos separa. And actually, that's correct because, well, it's like we have a channel here between England and, and France. And yeah, so, well, it's like that. That's the, the, that's the water <laughs> and the wine unite us. So, you know, right. <laughs> remember the church. If it wasn't for the church, we were not drinking wine. That's yeah, so it's a, some of the benefits of the religion sometimes. That's yeah, right. so that's really good. Yeah. So thank you very much, guys. So please stay here because, well, yeah. we're going to continue with the show. So, well, it's like I'm not saying that, well, it's, it's over. So let's go for a quick quiz for uh, our audience. In order that you can win, we are going to have two prizes. One is going to be the kit. That is the kit of mate that Whitney said. And I would like to ask you, Charlie and Carla. Charlie, give me a number from one to five. Five. Five, right? Yep. Okay. And you, Carla, give me a number between three to seven. Three. Perfect. Okay. So, well, it's like people, they will know that, well, I have. A weird mind and I'm just going to figure out how we're going to give these prices but well <laughs> we're going to have two questions so well it's like sorry three questions very easy questions so well remember in one comment you have to put the three answers okay so you put like one answer comma second answer comma and the third answer yeah so in one comment so please don't put an answer and give enter no the three answers together so the first question is going to be ready ready Roger, sorry, you cannot participate. No, neither you would. I wrote <coughs> questions, of course I can't Why? participate. <laughs> no, you can't, you can't participate. But well, the first hey, question- I'll take three wines. It's a box of wine, six bottles, yeah. come on. <laughs> you cannot participate, okay? Yeah, yes. uh, anyway, and, and by the way, People that they are in the UK, they are only people that they can participate for these, uh, for these prizes, okay? Because we cannot deliver around the world in this case. So, well, it's like the first question is gonna be, which country, a part of Uruguay, drinks mate? Mention one. As part of the culture, of course, don't tell me that, well, I have a friend that is living in Turkey or something, no. It's in, in, in a cultural way. Just give me one of the other countries that they are drinking mate in a regular basis, so as part of the culture, yeah? So, well, put that answer in, this, in the comments. So next, put a comma, yeah? And we're gonna put second, second answer. So the second question is, how many areas provide the 80% of the production of wine in Uruguay? Yeah, just a number, 
how many areas. You don't have to tell me the name of the areas, just the number. How many areas they are producing 80% of the complete production of wine in Uruguay. Yeah, got it? And the third question is, what is the most representative grape from Uruguay? Yeah, give me the name of that grape. And please send us your comments. Just you can give enter now. Meanwhile, we are going to go with Whitney for the Spanish lesson. All right, the pressure is on everyone. Um, also, here's that image I meant to put up earlier um, of the mate kit, the four different kinds and the gourd and the bombilla straw. So, okay, we're um, just going to move on really quickly. Before I do some slang, I think it's really interesting to and important to talk very briefly about one part of the Uruguayan accent that um, might stand out to some of us who aren't um, native spe Spanish speakers, and that's the j sound. Um, we talked about a little bit in prior episodes. Uh, if, if you take a phrase like como te llamas, it would be como te llamas. I wrote it phonetically and how it makes that sh sound. And same with Uruguayo. Uruguayo. So we have that accent. Um, and to hear more, I'm going to show you um, a link as well. Um, and, and at the end of my um, presentation. So that's just something that we want to talk about uh, that uh, Uruguay does. And we saw that in one of our early episodes with Argentina. And another thing that's really, really important to mention, not just in Uruguay, but a lot of the countries um, yes, in, in South America and even some in Central America, but particularly in the Southern Cone is the use of vos. So for English speakers, register for us doesn't really make sense. It's something that we struggle with when learning a language and we learn usted, which is formal, ustedes, which is plural for you. These are ways to say you, tú. And then if you learn in Spain and you spend some time in Spain and be included, you've at least been able to recognize vosotros. Vos is very, very different. It, um, in some countries, in particularly Uruguay, replaces the two um, and it's, um, and that's what they use in place of it. Now, other countries, they might use it in addition and they might um, go in and out. Um, but like I said, in Argentina and Uruguay, uh, this is used primarily. So if you're someone who likes to know what that looks and sounds like, it's very, very similar for most of the uh, tenses in the language. The only really main difference are um, a couple of verbs in the present tense and commands. But if you were to say, and I took these phrases from the Argentinian episode. So if you've seen this, you, that episode, you've seen this before. If you were to say you walked, like tu caminaste, it'd be vos caminaste. It'd be the same just with vos instead of tu. But, and that's in the past tense. So that's any other tense. But in the present tense, it's the same. You just have um, a little bit of an emphasis on it. Like tu caminas is vos caminas. So you just have a little bit more emphasis. So you're gonna hear that a lot um, for your next trip there. And just know that it's uh, perfectly normal and you're gonna hear it all the time. And you'll probably hear it in other countries as well, but particularly in Uruguay. Okay. So moving on to your favorite segment, which I know that a lot of you were talking about earlier, um, not just in this episode, but the last episode is heard on the street. So these are just a few words um, that are particular to Uruguayan Spanish. And one of them is astilla or astilla. Um, and that means it's very similar to mas o menos, more or less. And it's used when something is not quite bad, but definitely not good either. Um, so you could say like, no me gusta este café, estaba como astilla. Like I didn't really like that. It was, wasn't that good. Um, another one, which isn't something that <laughs> I would use in other, in slang, in any language, but bo was a word that came up a lot. <laughs> I know I'm laughing while I say it. Um, it's kind of similar to, oh gosh, I guess like bro or dude, or it's kind of like how we learned in Mexico, they say way. Um, and that's uh, bo. And then we have gaucho, which, okay, so we've heard this name before as like a skilled horseman. It's also an adjective that can mean helpful. And for those of us who reside in London, it's also a chain restaurant. But in Uruguay, this is a slang word for friend, like amigo or a good mate. And speaking of that, we have matear. We talked about mate. We couldn't possibly 
go uh, this episode without this word. And this term is used to describe the action of drinking mate. So you could say, estaba mateando cuando llegaste, like I was having mate when you arrived or something like that, or cuando vamos a matear. And then da is a common, it's kind of, it's a word that's like a common way to express an agreement, basically an alternative for okay or, or all right. Um, so you could say like, yo vuelvo en 20, da? Like I'm coming back in 20, okay? I, I think, so like, sorry to interrupt, but it's ta with T. Ta. Oh, ta. I apologize. <laughs> My research ta. told me da. Okay, that was one I didn't know. <laughs> okay, well, perfect. Um, and that's about it. So that is it for the slang. Um, also, there's a really good video on my website, Making Spanish Simple, and that contains an, a link to the history. Te invitamos a Montevideo if you go to the culture section, and you can learn a little bit more um, about the culture and history of Montevideo without the wine. And that's it for tonight. Okay, so ta. All right, ta. perfect. Mm -hmm. Ah. Excellent, my dear Whitney. Thank you very much. And well, it's like, uh, before we go, uh, before we say who are the winners, we already have it. Joseph, you know, it's like, well, do you remember number five and number three? They were the ones that they gave me. Okay, I will let you know how it's going to be, uh, which number is going to be the winners. But uh, let's go to a quick song from our friend Jorge uh, Nasser. That was like, uh, and remember, we're going to upload this music to the Spotify playlist of the Latin America show. So over to you, Roger. Well, this is an amazing artist, Jorge Nasser, born in Montevideo, Uruguay. Singer, musician, composer, and producer, starting in the 80s doing a mix of pop, Uruguayan rhymes, Candome and Murga. In the okay. 80s, he found a nice a nice band, Nickel. So we're gonna hear something about him. Pidiendo cuando ve un mi chico me pasar, alguien dice esto es el culo del mundo, alguien dice como el Uruguay no hay, yo he cambiado varias veces de idea y al final yo ya no sé qué. Y si es el voto que mi alma pronuncia 
iglesia. Tierra de gárgolas y vi otras cosas que mejor no nombrar. Tal vez un día no esté más en la radio. Tal vez un día tú me vas a olvidar. Pero antes tengo algo que decirte. Excellent, perfect, and extraordinary artist, as well as like, you know, well, if you want to listen more about uh, Jorge Nasser, of course, you can find us. You can find it not only in the playlist of the Latin America show on Spotify, also you can Google it. And we have put actually the link where you can find more of his music. So while well, it's time to go on, we have a couple of winners. So I just want to ask, um, well, to Whitney, which countries they were the ones that, well, people, they could answer like an uh, options for country that they are drinking mate? Um, primarily Paraguay, Argentina, um, Brazil, Bolivia, and I believe Chile, Chile as well qualifies. Excellent. Thank you very much. So while well, that Outside was one of the possible, there yeah. were the possible, and actually when we're talking about the 80% of the production, and correct me, um, uh, Carla, if I'm wrong, but we said that two regions produce 80% of the total of the volume of wines. Is that correct? Yes. And uh, of course, I think so. We're talking a lot about Tanat, that is like a grape that is very representative from Uruguay. That, well, is the, that would be the three answers. So, well, um, Charlie and uh, Carla, well, they gave me number three and number five. So, number three is going to be the winner for the mate. And the winner for the mate. Actually, it has to be the correct answers. I'm just counting people that they answered correctly. So the third correct answer was for Carolina Prada. So congratulations to Carolina, who is winning this, um, this prize, this kit of mate, courtesy of, from our friends from Urushop. Dot UK, dot co dot UK. So well, if you want to buy more stuff from Uruguay, don't forget to visit this amazing shop online. And the winner for this Fantastic. Well, that is the other, the other one. Right? Yeah, yeah. Now we can pass to vinos, la, vino Latinos. Yeah, so the winner for this box of this one is going to be the sum of five that Charlie gave me and three that, uh, that Carla gave me. So number eight. And the number eight who answered correctly, it was Carolina Cordova. So today it was the day for the Carolinas. Yeah. But well, Carolina Cordova, uh, she's the winner of this box of six bottles of wine, courtesy of Vino Latino. So thank you very much uh, to Carla, uh, uh, of course. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and remember, you can visit the website and you can try these different kind of wines that we have spoken that they are just fantastic. So, well, it's time to say goodbye. So I would like to say, first of all, thank you very much for our, well, to our guests. So Carolina, thank you very much for being here. 
Carla, even. Car I, <laughs> sorry, it was because the winner there and Carolina. Yes, okay. sorry, Carla. Okay. Yeah, it's oh my been, it's God. Been my, it's been my absolute pleasure. Thank you very much. Uh, it's been great to take you all on a little journey to Uruguay. Thank you very much, Carla. Charlie, thank you very much for being with us tonight. My pleasure, my pleasure. And, and hopefully next time while we do something else with Carla, because I think we inform and we gave a lot of good stuff for at least have a sip of uh, your way and wine tonight. You know what? Maybe one of the things that we can do is like kind of uh, a wine tasting. So you can send us in advance the bottles of wine and we can try it here in the show. And you can explain us, of course. So we can share with the audience the complete experience. Or, yeah. Yeah, or I was thinking we can go and drink in with me when the lockdown finish, we can go to Venus Latinos and have the <laughs> wine tasting there. And Charlie, come here yeah. and prepare some yeah, yeah. Everyone. Yeah, Everyone. Yeah. We That's go right. to the warehouse with Carla with a wine yeah. open. <laughs> Keeping social distancing, of course, like three meters. So each of us, we're going to have our bottle of wine. No, three yeah. meters. <laughs> yeah. So thank you very much, Carla. Thank you very much, Charlie, uh, for being tonight with us. Uh, well, it's time to say goodbye. Uh, Whitney, um, Okay. Well, thank you everyone for watching tonight. I'm very, very excited to buy my first um, bottles of Uruguayan wine very soon. And um, we'll see you next week where we will, shall I spoil this again? Yes, um, please. Yes, do it. Okay. We're going to talk Peru and we're going to talk dance and cocktails. So dry January isn't over yet. So we are going to entice you with um, some cocktails and some dance. So looking forward to seeing you then. And I will update the music on the Spotify playlist, post it in a couple days. Um, and that's about it. Brilliant. Uh, Thank me, you very much. By the way, Whitney, I have the place where to go. I'm going to send you for, uh, you know. Perfect. A, I'm in. Where? Yes, please. Okay. In Buffalo. Yeah. Great, done. <laughs> thank Excellent. you. Excellent. So, well, and on the other side, well, thank you very much, Roger Alacon. Hey, just hold on a second. I'm ordering my wines because the wine <laughs> is life. Wait a second. Wait a second. Oh, to everyone, thank you very much for tonight's show. And, you know, drink wine and try the Uruguayan. Yes. Yeah, it's a, it's a recommendation from experts. So, well, don't take it like it's just we are engaging you to drink wine, try Uruguayan, try uh, Uruguayan wine, of course, Tanat. And well, I would like to say thank you very much for all the sponsors, for all the people that they have been here to urushop.co.uk, uh, Pinot Latinos, and also to Tuvo, that while well, we have the opportunity to make this kind of, uh, to share the signal with them, and while well, they are broadcasting our show on Tuvo tonight. So while well, if you have the opportunity to download these applications where you can watch some TV on demand. So thank you very much, all the people that they were participating. Uh, congratulations to both Carolina. So if you can send us a quick message to the Latin America show in order that we can, and send you all your contact details in order that we can just uh, send you your prices. And well, thank you to Pamela Rawlings, Lily, uh, Adriana Velasquez, Hernan, um, Yvonne, Lily Martinez in Mexico. Uh, well, everybody, thank you very much for being here. And remember, well, the Latin America show is every Tuesday at 8 p.m. London time. My name is Enrique Gelista. It's a pleasure. And well, keep safe. Let's uh, meet up next week. So thank you very much. Have a good week. Bye. Bye-bye.